I apologize that we're starting late, but we had some technical difficulties. So I'm going to call this workshop to order and we'll go ahead and move on down the line here. So uh, section two will be the approval of the agenda, 2.1 changes to agenda and approval of the agenda. Section three will be recognitions, 3.1 recognition of the 21, 20, 21 through 2022 Okaloosa County School District Outstanding School Volunteers as presented by Superintendent Chambers. Section four at this time, we had no visitors on the agenda. Section five, we have quite a few administrative personnel appointments on Monday night. So 5.1 will be the appointment of Chief Financial Officer Finance. And this will be filling, which has been a interim position, but we are gonna now finally make it a Fishing. Chief Financial Officer without the interim in it. Uh, 5.2, appointment of Athletic Director, Niceville High School. 5.3, appointment of Principal, Destin Elementary School. 5.4, appointment of Assistant Principal 2, 10-month, Ruckel Middle School. And then 5.5, appointment of Assistant Principal 2, 10-month, Wright Elementary School. And Section 6, if public comment. And I have received no blue cards this morning, So, but 6.1 is members of the public desiring to address the school board Form MIS 5241, public input and or discussion of agenda items. And this was the four minute version of public comment. Section seven, uh, committee and staff reports. Uh, 7.1 will be in county travel paid for the period of May 26th through June 8th, 2022, presented by Julie Perry. Uh, 7.2, out of county travel paid for the period of May 26th through June 8th, 2022. And then 7.3 updates to Okaloosa County School Health Services Manual 2022 through 2023. And that would be presented by Ms. Schroeder. And section eight, we'll move to that, will be a consent agenda. 8.1 is the approval of the consent agenda. And board members, as we go down, we have a lot of items in section eight. Please stop me at any time if you have questions. We have staff and guests out here that could answer some of your questions if you have them. Uh, 8.2 will be the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of June 13, 2022. Uh, 8.3 request to advertise a public hearing for a revision of school board policies chapter 8 personnel instructional and chapter 9 person, personal uh, administrative managerial and this is presented by Dr. Lee Hale. Uh, 8.4 budget amendment number nine fiscal year 2021 through 2022 8.5 monthly financial statement for may 2022 8.6 school donations and mr chair if i yes. might some of those are pretty substantial so i'd just like to thank members of the public who are making substantial donations to our schools that's yes. very significant and very yes, meaningful if you're a school principal yes Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, 8.7, payroll warrant register and accounts payable warrant register for May 2022, totaling $31,033,018.36, and bank transfers for May 2022, totaling $45,000. 8.8, fiscal year 2021 through 2022 inventories, all schools and departments. And on that, I'd just like to thank Julie for making that more clear mm -hmm. i like the addition of the columns you added so that we can more easily see what's really happening with those items thank you and when we were discussing this on monday to put it on the agenda this was a, a, a good conversation that we had in mm -hmm. clearing that up so so thank you julie i was impressed at how the because this is a difficult um usually our custodians are in charge of the inventory and trying to keep up with hundreds and hundreds of things within the school and they've done a very nice job in the few items that are missing or you can tell are old items that more than likely were anyway. yes yeah, put into surplus somebody didn't see the small tag on it and that's why it's on here but kudos to our custodians or whoever at the school is um, overseeing this inventory because it is a difficult large job so, nice job right. 8.9 will be price increase request for ITB 18-07 custodial equipment and repair services district-wide 8.10 renewal with price increase for ITB 18-20 locksmith services. 8.11 ITB 22-22 emergency bid for con construction of portable elevated walkways, stairs, and ramps. 
8.12, renewal of RFP 17-05, beverage vending services. 8.13, renewal of RFP 19-2, uh, various equipment and amenities for parks and playgrounds. 8.14, tag on bid purchase over $25,000, strategic equipment, LLC. 8.15, exempted purchase over $25,000, AbleNet Incorporated. 8.16, exempted purchase over $25,000, Benchmark Education. 8.17, exempted purchase over $25,000, Curriculum Associates. 8.18, amendment to service agreement number 22-55, Stephen Bear Jr. 8.19, service agreement number 23-02, Bryce Milton. 8.20, service agreement number 23-03, Christopher Mills. 8.21, service agreement number 23-04, Grow Your Gift Services, LLC. 8.22, service agreement number 23-05, Jahari Harris. 8.23, service agreement number 23-06, Kelsey Marlowe. 8.24, service agreement number 23-07, Kenneth Rhodes. 8.25, service agreement number 23-11, Emerald Coast Science Center, Family Science Night. 8.26, service agreement number 23-12, Emerald Coast Science Center, STEM Field Trips. 8.27, service agreement number 23-13, Emerald Coast Science Center, Guided Dissection. And I had a question on that one, but I'm not seeing Tammy, so I think that's who I probably... But Diane Frazier is here. But Diane, Diane Frazier okay. is here. Hi. Yes. I have a quick question on this one. Ms. Frazier, if you want to come on up to this... We're going to give you some time anyway when we get past there. At least I was going to give you some time. So. Yes. Hi. This has to do with the dissection, and I think maybe all board members received an email maybe in the last week about how we go about doing dissection. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that for the elementary, that was the owl pellets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for middle school and high school, mm -hmm. are we using animals or is it all guided through technology, computer-based? How it Honestly, nobody has taken advantage of that. <laughs> So the only things that we've actually done is owl pellets. And that's usually fourth, fifth grade, mm -hmm. about. And honestly, the only time that we've done that is um, we used to do it in the summer camp program that was at Blue Water Bay Elementary School. Mm -hmm. That's the only program that's taken advantage of that um, product. Okay. So. I'll get with Miss Ellis also and kind of sure thing. I'm curious mm -hmm. about what we do in our, and I know I talked to Miss Lightborn, and it's funny how this is kind of coming back again. It's just my curiosity about what we do in middle school, or basically with the high schools, about dissection. So, okay, mm -hmm. I'll check in. Okay, and great. Ms. Frazier, I just want to say while you're up here, um, what a wonderful um, asset you are to our school district with <laughs> yes. your program down there and at the uh, Science Center and um, so many items here you see and so it's great that we're and I know you're glad we're back to being yes. able to do yes. some field trips <laughs> and get back into that because there was a time where it was we were, we're it was really, really scary yeah. you yeah. missed so us we. and we missed you so um you want to tell us anything that's kind of happening there I know there's been a lot of uh new sure things. um so one of the things that we did um, when the pandemic first hit was we really focused on our outside space because we have almost two acres in our property. Um, and since that time period, we have built a tree house. We built out a full-blown boating exhibit. So we have um, a signage. We have a pontoon boat. Now, remember, they're sitting on the ground. Um, and we built a dock, and we have a wave runner. We have a, a sunfish sailboat donated by none other than John Williams. Um, and then we have a canoe and we have a kayak um, and this gives the opportunity for students to come in to sit on these boats to acclimate these boats um, we have signs that talk about the different parts of them we have signs that talk about the rules and regulations based on Fish and Wildlife and Coast Guard that go to each type of vessel like we have a um, life jacket display 
we have um, a red and green channel markers so that we talk about navigation, we talk about weather. We feel this is very important because we know that we have huge issues with boating accidents and um, people coming to our area that have no boating experience and they rent a pontoon boat. So we always say it's a great place to come and sort of, you know, get your feet wet, get acclimated, learn about the rules and regulations before you actually take to the water. Um, and then we got the steam bus from Liza Jackson and that's up and running and we have hands-on added activities on the steam bus we've gotten some new exhibits um, we just June 1st ribbon cutting our um, exhibit based on the Florida Trail so this is um, 200 feet of fence line that was painted by the ADSO artist and it is absolutely gorgeous so the Florida Trail starts at Fort Pickens so the first piece of the fence is a beach scene and then as you walk through the trail um, the scenery along the fence line changes um, to match that section of Florida. It ends at Big Cypress Swamp so depending on which way you take the trail it's about 1200 to 1500 miles. There's a couple of little spots where you can go either direction. Um, so we worked with the Florida Forest Service, all native plants. We have statues of animals that you might encounter on the trail, information on hiking, how to read blazes, how to leave no trace. Um, very important, you know, pack it in, pack it out sort of a thing. So we're really excited about that. Um, built our tree house. We, uh, yeah, we've got a lot going on. Um, Lots of fun stuff this summer, getting ready to write our field trip um, lesson plans for this coming up year and our outreach programming for this year. So uh, it looks really different than it did before the pandemic. And it was so much fun to be able to have some field trips come back this spring and see the kids and see the, um, the teachers and they're like, wow, you know, you guys have been busy. Um, so yeah, that was awesome. So, and on a closing note, I just wanna give you a personal thank you to Oklahoma County School District. Um, I have two children that went from elementary school all the way through the IB program at Choctaw. And just two weeks ago, my daughter officially became a Dr. Sarah Frazier, and she starts her residency program at um, Sky Ridge Medical Center in Denver in internal medicine on Monday. But I don't think that that would have happened or could have happened without the incredible educational foundation that she received here in Okaloosa County. Um, so I just want to say thank you to the board now and to the board over the last 25 years. Um, <laughs> You know, and the leadership in our school district that has continued to provide these opportunities for students to, you know, have their needs be met and also opportunities for them to excel and challenge them as well um, because it's working. And, um, and so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank That's you. Great. I know. That's that fine. <laughs> great job. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So if any questions about um, any of the other stuff on the... Well, I just want to comment since we're in the middle, but we're going to go ahead and comment on, I'm going to comment on the okay. experience that I had oh, that's back right. in May. You did the field and trip with we us. We did the field trip, and you're right, just to see the, the, the kids, the students, everybody who was part, participating. Mm -hmm. And what's so cool about it, it's hands-on. I mean, you get, a, you get it into their hands, whether mm -hmm. it's the the uh, uh, the hedgehog. <laughs> did you hold the snake? I did not hold the snake. <laughs> I, 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 but I did get to pet the snake. So see, uh, there you go. <laughs> but uh, but you know, she took me outside to go see all the neat things that were outside. And when you know our typical afternoon thunderstorm, well, in this case, it was in the morning, mm -hmm. showed up and lightning popping all over the place. So we didn't make it too far out there. But yep. but Diane, your your passion definitely shows. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, and your staff did a, does a great job too. Oh, and the I'm fact so that blessed. the yes, last two you. years have been trying, the reason why y'all made it through here was because of your leadership. So, and uh, what you do, <laughs> what you do outside the community, uh, in the community to, to hype up the, uh, mm -hmm. the Emerald Coast Science Center, mm -hmm. you know, it's because of your leadership. So uh, take, we're going to give you some kudos. Oh, thank to that, you, so. I appreciate that. And I know you're a very <laughs> humble person, but. But thank you. Thank you for all that you did. And Ms. Frazier is also on the board of our Public Schools Foundation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> She's Another involved. incredible organization that supports our students, um, you know, for a number of years in a number of ways as well. So, all right. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. So now we'll just move on down to 8.28 service agreement number 23-14 Emerald Coast Science Center Planetarium Program. 
8.29, service agreement number 23-15, Emerald Coast Science Center, Science on Wheels. And 8.30, service agreement number 23-16, Emerald Coast Science Center, SSA Enrichment Program. 8.31, service agreement number 23-19, Pat L. 8.32, service agreement number 23-20, Ethica LLC. 8.33, service agreement number 23-21, Hannah Donaro. 8.34, service agreement number 23-23, Brent Purcell. 8.35, reject bids for RFP 22-02, sale of surplus property, Lovejoy Road, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. 8.36, RFP 22-03, sale of surplus property, East North Avenue, Crestview, Florida. 8.37, surplus salvage and dispose of one portable building, school board owned tangible property in accordance with Florida statutes 1013-2828-2A and 274.06, presented by Steve Bolton. And then 8.38, sale and disposal of surplus property. 8.39, educational partnership agreement, EPA between the Department of the Air Force, uh, presented by the 96th Test Wing Eglin Air Force Base and the School Board of Okaloosa County, Florida, to promote STEM education. Would Mr. Horton like to come and share some information? I mean, this looks really exciting, mm -hmm. Mr. Horton, this yep. partnership. Um, I'll let you. Yes, ma'am, thanks. So this is a great partnership agreement with uh, Eglin 96th Test Wing. Uh, what it does is it creates the framework with which we can draw on the resources at Eglin and the 96th Test Wing to support our students in the STEM education program. So the update this morning uh, that the board saw was uh, Ms. Lajeunesse doing the great work and identifying several um, STEM activities already that are available and going on in the school district. And of course that list will grow over the course of the year, I believe. We've got um, General Kane uh, going out uh, as the commander at Eglin uh, and, and, Gen and uh, Brigadier General, I think, uh, Garrity coming on board shortly. So, Superintendent, I look forward to, to working with Elaine and setting up continued meetings to stay um, working with the base and, and supportive of them. And they are certainly a big supporter of the school district. Um, and, and so, this is a great opportunity for schools to do things with after school programs, with mentors, guest speakers. Um, a, a few years ago, it's been a number of years, I think, where we had some programs where students could intern. Um, during the summer out um, in the math lab and other places out on Eglin. So we want to start those programs back up again. Um, and, and so again, working with Ms. Lajeunesse um, to keep these things going and growing is, is important for us. Uh, we'll do similar work with Herbert Field as well. I, I have regular meetings with um, Colonel Richards at the base out there and they're undergoing a change in leadership as well. Um, but we look to, to bring an MLU to you defer, at a further later date to, to access some of what Herbert Field can offer as well. Once again, it's just great, our partnership with our military, and uh, it's, uh, it's a long, long term, and it's been great. We're always coming up with new things and ways to, to work together. I think yes, it's awesome. Yes, ma'am. They're and good partners with us. so Thanks. many resources, so many rich resources here that we can bring our students into and to be a part of and to see, and we're very fortunate where we are, like you said, that we have this, yep. these opportunities with our service. Right, so we'll move down to item 8.40, agreement for the school resource officer program between the school board of Okaloosa County, Florida and the sheriff of Okaloosa County, Florida for the 2022 through 2023 school year. And I'll just comment, it's great that again, we're able to have this great partnership with our sheriff's department, uh, our county uh, administrators, uh, and all of our schools to have a SRO in all of our schools. And in some cases we have two. Uh, I know across the state, some school districts don't have the luxury of uh, having a great relationship like we do with our, our people that are involved with all this. So it's great to see that we're going to continue this uh, again for next year. And you know, there, um, the Sheriff's Department is uh, suffering what a lot of us are with getting enough employees. So I'm glad that we can still have this and they are able to uh, fill those, our needs with schools, like you said, we've added two uh, to some schools, so uh, that's that's great. But like I said, I I feel for them too, trying to get enough employees to do 
what they need to do, but uh, we have, uh, as we've seen, not just in our opinion, but through awards and everything, uh, the, the finest SRO unit or program in the state of Florida, and uh, we're lucky to, to have that because I can't imagine That's operating difficult. every day without them. Yeah. Difficult position. All right, so 8.41 is the renewal of the Florida School Board's Insurance Trust Membership and Property and Casualty Insurance Program presented by Russ Frakes. And school board members, uh, I have invited uh, Mr. Frakes, but also our FISBIT team here today. Uh, as you know, in April, uh, being a trustee, I got to go to our, our latest meeting and a lot of great information came out of that, but a lot of information that I felt like you, you needed to hear from not only Mr. Frakes, but also from our FISBIT team, just to kind of let you know what headwinds we're running into when it comes to insurance and casualty and all that stuff that's going on out there. So, Mr. Frakes? Sure. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and, and get started. So yes, thank you. Uh, good morning good to morning. school board members and Mr. Superintendent. Uh, we are uh, presenting today the renewal of our property and casualty insurance program through Florida School Board's Insurance Trust. And as a reminder uh, to everyone and those that may be listening, the Florida School Board's Insurance Trust, thank you, ma'am, I appreciate that. Uh, the Florida School Board's Insurance Trust is affiliated with the Florida School Board's Association, created in 1981, and serves the purpose of solely of providing insurance services to the member school districts, of which there are now 13, I believe, David? Yes. Um, uh, we just added uh, DeSoto County uh, last week. Um, so, uh, and they offer claims administration services, so they have claims adjusters that handle all of our workers' compensation <laughs> claims uh, to uh, uh, any, you know, if we have a school bus accident, those kinds of things. We have personnel on, on their FISBIT personnel on staff to handle those for us. We're working directly with them on a daily basis. They also help us with uh, loss control services. They have folks uh, on, on staff that are dedicated to those, those types of things, inspecting playgrounds to help make sure that they're safe or uh, look, helping us analyze data, those, those kinds of things, uh, training initiatives that we may pursue. And we'll talk about some of those here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, they also provide us with all of, they provide us access to insurance markets that help us to obtain all the insurance policies that we're renewing today. So, uh, and there are quite a few as, as, uh, that, that comprise that total package of benefits. Uh, as Mr. Bryant uh, mentioned, uh, we have uh, David Stevens, he's the executive director of, of FISBIT. Uh, Scott Blazer, I think, was going to make it in the room, but, uh, and then James Woodside, who is uh, uh, the broker for the trust uh, with Alliant. So uh, they are here today, and, and uh, uh, they are the gentlemen that uh, we rely on uh, to uh, help us make it through all these, uh, this renewal process. It's been, and it's been, uh, it's been quite, a, quite a task this year, uh, more so than most. So um, just a quick, quick couple of comments about uh, the, a mar an, over, an overview of the insurance market in general. And we talked about this last time I spoke with you. We did a report after the last uh, quarterly update just to let you know what's going on out there in the insurance market. What, what, are, we, what are we navigating when it comes to uh, obtaining insurance? And there are about, uh, the, we're in what's termed a hardening cycle still. Um, that means just a period of increasing prices in the insurance industry. So uh, property rate increases are typically in the 10 to, 10 to 30 percent range. Um, we're going to be somewhere in that we, we fall into that range, and we'll see here in just a minute. Um, other things that are impacting that, and with property specifically, of course, the construction industry is a big factor there. Uh, so construction prices are up. We know that. Uh, we see that in the news all the time. Social inflation is another impact. We see increased jury awards, uh, increased litigation. Those all contribute. Also, uh, low uh, interest rates also inhibit the uh, carriers from earning more money on the investments that they make. So they have to, they in turn pass that on to the, to the, uh, to the insured. So, but the, all of this just emphasizes how important it is that we have a very strong risk management program and that we look to control what we can. Those market forces we cannot control. We have to, we have to expend all the effort we can in con controlling those items that we can that are, that are in our you know, experience related items. So. Uh, we'll talk about some of those here in just a, just a minute. Um, our property renewal premium increased by 22%, so we're right in that 20 to 30% range. Uh, seven, we were a little over 7.5% uh, in increased total insured value. So, in other words, our buildings are more expensive because, again, the impact of increased cost of construction. So those are trended forward 
uh, by that percentage. So a, a good percentage of that, a good chunk of that uh, premium increase was due to just the simple fact that our that our, our buildings are more valuable than they were last year. Um, and on the horizon, as we add more square footage, we're going to see con that, that continue. We're going to have more buildings to ensure as we ha uh, complete some of these construction projects and those buildings come into service. Um, I, would, I did add a, to point out, I wanted to make sure that we understood that, uh, to remind everyone that we, there, was, there, was no, there was no surplus distribution this year. So the trust members consider actions throughout the course of a year. The trust members, Mr. Bryant serves as the trustee for Okaloosa County School District. I also now have a vote as a, as, as a member of the executive committee. Uh, and we consider what those options might be and to include potentially uh, distributing some surplus and that's taken place over the past couple of years. Uh, we did not have a surplus distribution this year, but since we've been in the, in the trust, uh, almost a half million dollars has been distributed back to Okaloosa County. That's been the, the pro rata share Okaloosa County has received in those surplus distributions. So there is a potential to, to get back from the trust and some of these premiums that we are paying whenever it's warranted. Uh, and that helps defray some of those costs. This, I, I put this graphic up just to show the complexity of the insurance program that's put together. Those are all different insurance carriers that have different layers of coverage. Um, I would not, we, we go through this and, and um, everyone's eyes kind of glaze over a little bit when James uh, starts talking about this, this process, but it just shows you, I just put that in there simply to illustrate the complexity that goes in, that, that is behind the scenes really that, that we get access to through Alliant and Fisbit uh, working to put this program together. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, on the casualty side, so workers' compensation claims, litigated claims, things like that, bus accidents and, and uh, that category of claims, uh, we see the experience that we've, we've, uh, we've shown here over the past couple of years and see that we've kind of flattened out with our experience. We had a spike there in 2018 and a great year in 2016, but we really kind of uh, have leveled out there at that one and a half million dollar range. We want to continue to try to improve and get better results as we go through, and we're, we're taking some, so this, this, these are the results we're seeing. Uh, uh, what are we doing in, in, in to try to get better results and try to improve our, our overall experience? Um, so uh, one of the items that we work with our adjusters on is subrogating on those claims where someone, for in, most, the most common, uh, common time that happens is in, bus accidents, whenever we have a, a, uh, a bus accident and some other party is at fault, we're going to pursue that, pursue recovery from the insurance parties. Our buses are, as you can imagine, with a, a, a car and a, and a school bus, the school bus fares pretty well typically, so they're relatively low recoveries, but we're still going after them. Even if they're only a few hundred dollars, we're picking those dollars up uh, and making sure that we follow through to make those recoveries. We've recovered more than $100,000 now through those efforts, uh, through the course of our experience with FISBIT. So I think it's important that we don't leave that money on the table and that we follow through and pick that money up. Uh, special contingency risk is uh, a policy that we have, an insurance carrier that we have that's a London-based carrier that has offered us some, some uh, provided us with a training allowance. We work closely with them to develop um, a training program. Uh, in fact, Mr. Dean, Danny Dean, uh, was involved in that process as well. It is targeted at those safe schools officers. Um, they have a, uh, a, a consultant that they've provided us with. He's a former FBI agent, uh, had a lot of tremendous things. And, and to Mr. Bryant's point, the discussion about the SRO programs, he was very complimentary of Florida in general and the way that we approach school safety, school security. Uh, but we've developed this program with, in conjunction with special contingency risk that I think is going to be a great uh, resource. Just one more resource that's available for uh, they'll, they will also be available to SROs, so we're looking forward to have that coming online. It should be online very, very shortly. Uh, drone surveys continue. That's a, a great program that FISBIT offers us through their IT uh, department. So they've just been out here a couple of weeks ago to refly some of our schools, and that imagery is helpful in, in multi multiple respects, uh, providing some information to Mr. Dean so that we have some detailed maps, photographic, uh, some aerial photography that's, that's available that uh, can be helpful from a security standpoint, but also uh, in the case that we have uh, claims, uh, we'll be able to establish pre-loss condition versus what, uh, what we're seeing, what an adjuster may see on a roof. Uh, Vector Solutions is our online training portal that we've used now for a couple of years. We started using it. We administered about 13,000, almost 13,000 trainings last year. Uh, some excellent material that's, that's provided there, uh, formerly called Safe Schools. We've discussed that before. Uh, we're using it more and more. It's a powerful tool. We've seen uh, trust-wide, uh, the more that inverse relationship between trainings completed and claims. So 
uh, to the extent that we can use that. We're really only scratching the surface at that level. We can still do more, and we're going to keep continue to push that. Uh, one of the great things that we've done that uh, we've continued now, and we're in the middle of uh, Chris O'Shea and myself are in the middle of completing. We're meeting with each of our principals. Uh, we've completed. Uh, Chris O'Shea assisted with putting these binders together for each principal, so they've got a. And this is these are going to show the results, the data, the claims data that generated by their school. And we've created a risk management program for them, customized to the types of losses that are occurring at their school so that we can try to improve that result in all of these conversations that we have with them. Having all the data is wonderful. Having the video training platform is a, is a great tool, but the conversations that our principals have with faculty and staff is the most impactful uh, tool that we have to impact our results. So we're having those conversations with our principals, and we've had some excellent conversations with them, engaging them in the risk management process. All of this aimed at creating a culture of safety in Okaloosa County Schools. We've made tremendous strides. There's still, still work to be done, and we'll continue to work with them on, on doing that and moving them through that process. But this is a, this is a great, a great uh, tool to be able to do that. We continue that, or the plan is to continue that annually. We do that in the summer, so it's, it's worked well. Our runoff claims, those old claims that we have, that the legacy claims that we have that predate our membership in FISBIT continue to decline. So our, even though those claims occurred before we were with FISBIT, FISBIT staff still assists us with getting those closed out. We're down to 29 of those. So we started, I think we had some where over 100. So uh, those have continued to dwindle. We want to get those claims closed because certainly we know that the, uh, the best claims are, aside from those that don't happen, are the ones that are closed. So we try to try to expend a lot of effort in getting those closed. So uh, that, that's, uh, that brings us to the conclusion of it. Any questions that you may have? Or? So. Are you going to share the dental move on into? Uh, no. Not, not not yet, yet. Okay. but we will be. Okay. I will, uh, it'll right. be on a, okay. a, an upcoming agenda, I'm probably next meeting. We'll see that. And, yes, um, we will have that. We will have that soon. And, okay. So I won't okay. To, so as a as a we'll we'll tease that for next time. Okay. okay. I have a question, yes, uh, Mr. Frakes. Um, so you talked about um, the construction and the and you you mentioned about adding on to, you know, like the multi-purpose rooms. Those yes, things are happening. Yes, ma'am. What about just in general that you know we are upgrading and fixing up? Does that I'm assuming, like when you have a house, you fix it up, you get appraised a little bit more. Is that the same with our uh, well, different? There will be an appraisal process that goes that. So what's happened previously in the past couple of years is those those uh, total insured values have been trended forward by formula, and James could probably speak to this maybe a little better than I, but we're it there has not been an on-site appraisal done uh, in several years. So that's going to take place over the next several months, half a year or so, where we'll have. Uh, actually it'll be a FISBIT staff member that come through all the, all the member districts and we'll be appraising the buildings to make sure that what we've got is accurate, that we're accurately valuing our buildings so that should something happen, we have adequate resources in place to, to protect, that, protect, those, protect the district's assets. So uh, that, that, will, that, that will likely have an impact, it could have an impact to the extent that uh, what we've seen now, what we've estimated and, and trended forward, uh, you know, if that's if, if they find, if they go out and inspect and find something different or that the, the, the building value is elevated, there could be some upward, uh, some upward uh, uh, movement on that total insured value because of that, that element as well. But wouldn't element. also some of the upgrades we're making are making our buildings uh, safer yes, because they're, they're up to code and, and all that, wouldn't that even out so that it wouldn't cost us as much? Because in other words, mm -hmm. we're, we're making it safer right. so we shouldn't have to worry about it, you know, uh, safety wise like well, to, I don't know fires or different things sure. like that on the other hand the value of the school may be upgraded because we fixed it up to the point where right right well to the extent you have value. I mean one of the concerns is you know I, th I think about roofing and I know there's a tremendous right. amount of roofing projects that are included in that to the extent that you have a newer roof certainly you're in better mm -hmm. think about it with uh, homeowners basis you know insurance companies are constantly asking right. you, you know well, how old is your, your roof? roof when's your yeah. roof replaced last because we know certainly that when we have storms, they, even if they're mm -hmm. just your typical Sunday or uh, summer storms, uh, yeah. they uh, they can be impactful. And but we're also got, doing plumbing yes, and electric and all of that Absolutely. upgrades. You know, some of these going back to decades. So that I would think that that would make the school in a way more insurable because right. it's not going to. I don't know the the impact that that has directly on on premium, um, but uh, certainly. Uh, you know, to the extent that the buildings are, are being upgraded, we're, we're going to be in better condition should, should something happen. 
you know, with specifically the roof, roofing. So I guess what I was getting at is that does that help us in the cost of what we're having to? Will the imp will the uh, upgrades that we're making to our buildings impact yeah, the premiums directly? Right. I'm uncertain about that. I'm not okay. sure about any direct. I'm just saying, are these upgrades to our advantage on that cost wise, or uh, or is it are they making considered us in more the rating? I don't, yeah. I don't. I'm not. I'm not certain about that. That I don't know. James, can you, you have any insight on that, or David? David maybe can speak to that. David Stevens, come up. Yes, when we go to market, okay, that's a big factor because what we do is we have to talk to all those 40 uh, reinsurers that you look at. So really what we talk about is we talk about how our schools are in good shape. We talk about the roofing projects. We talk about all these improvements that we do, okay? We also talk about Florida Code because Florida Code is tougher than a lot of these states, mm -hmm. okay, when you start building. So really that helps us. It's part of our presentation to them, and we work that very hard. Okay. okay, and and they appreciate it. I can tell you, they appreciate all the drone videos because they say we want to see what we're insuring. Okay, mm -hmm. and I can say we can show you down uh, to the air conditioning units on the roofs. Okay, what you're insuring. So it makes a um, a big difference in the price that we get. We get a better price. We insure about six and a half billion dollars worth of property. So we're a big account when we go to them, and also it, it helps in the fact that. Um, they, they have a lot of confidence that they know what they are insuring with us. So does that Right, so what we're doing is actually yes. going to help us because yes. they're going to say, oh, that, in good a, shape. And, and, and Dave makes that comment. It's a good, we've got a good story to tell whenever they go out there and make the case to the insurance company, yes. to, the, to the underwriters when we're securing, when oh, they, yeah. uh, David and James are out there yeah. securing coverage uh, because of yeah. those things, that, and that does play in. So those do, do play yeah. in. So Okay, great. And, and we shop the domestic market. We go to London. Okay, we go to Bermuda. If the prices keep going up, we're going to go to Asia. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go wherever uh, we can get the best price for you. So we really shop it very mm -hmm. hard uh, as far as that goes. But Russ is right. There's one thing we can't control. I really can't control the property market. Sure. But we do time and again. Uh, they will tell you we model horribly because we're in Florida. Okay, but because of our performance, our claims performance, okay, we are an outstanding account for them. So we get a much better price than a lot of people do. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Dave, Dave, come on, come on back up here real quick. <laughs> so, uh, real quick, could you give a, like a state of the union address of FISBIT in general? What's our? Well, um, FISBIT continues to grow. We're at 13 now. When I came in, we were at eight districts, okay? We're now at 13. More and more people are seeing the advantages of, of being in FISBIT. Really, our goal is to provide you the services that you need, uh, comprehensive uh, risk management services. Um, so a lot of districts are seeing the benefits of that. There's one area that you can really save money and not cut your educational programs, and that's in risk management. <laughs> Uh, good risk management programs for a district this size will save you hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that you can keep in the classrooms. Um, so FISBIT really is doing very well. We're very financially sound. Okay, we have, um, because of the rate of increase that we've had, and you've seen this over the last four years, you're paying double what you were before. Mm -hmm. So really um, what we're trying to do now is we're trying to take some of our long-term reserves that we have and put them into our cash flow. So because of the... Um, the timing that we have, mm -hmm. we actually renew in May, okay? The districts aren't paying anything until July. So what's happened uh, internally for FISBIT is, is that puts a cash flow issue for us. We're taking some of our long-term, or we anticipate that we're gonna take some of our long-term investments, move them over to cash flow, so that we can continue to pay that um, premium in May, and you all won't pay uh, anything until July, um, as far as that goes. Yeah, FISBIT just, uh, it, it's tough getting to, um, the employees that we need because those uh, insurance adjusters are, are especially experienced ones are very valuable and we have a very experienced staff and they are headhunted constantly I will tell you um, I'll tell you something else too um, you have an outstanding risk manager and I mean an outstanding risk manager okay and the reason that he is a trustee on the board now is because his peers selected him to be their representative so that is a big kudo, um, you know, for Russ and for your district because they recognize, you know, that he is an outstanding risk manager. Um, and, and he really can't do his job without your support. And I, I really appreciate uh, Superintendent Chambers. I know you've been very supportive, Mr. Bryant, the rest of the board. So when he comes to you, my advice to you, when he comes to you with programs that he needs to do, these programs will actually save you money in the long term, okay? 
they keep your employees safer, they keep your students safer, they keep your community safer, uh, all those things. Risk management is front end stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what risk management is, and he does an excellent job of that. Okay, claims management is what my adjusters do and the attorneys do for you, okay? Uh, that's claims management. So really, when you're talking about risk management, this is the man uh, that you really want to listen to. And anything that you need, FISBIT is here to get it for you, okay? That's our motto. Whatever you need, we try to supply it for you. And board members, I'll just tell you, since uh, I, I was uh, asked to be uh, the trustee for our school district when we started back in 2017, I, I remember going to the first meeting and looking at Okaloosa County and uh, I believe it was Madison County that came on at the same time. And, uh, you know, we were bringing we were bringing a lot to the table, a lot. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, not good to the right. to Fizbit. Right. Uh, but what what's been really great to see is how Okaloosa County we're now in our fifth year and how much of an improvement we've made uh, across the board, especially when it comes to, like you said, uh, Dave, as far as risk management training, uh, just taking advantage of the front end part of that. And it's to the point now that, you know, I don't like slide underneath of my my chair when I see the numbers come up because we're actually doing yeah, really good. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I first saw that, I, I remember going, back to the superintendent previous superintendent and just saying you know hey if we can work you know on the front end of this this is going to help us in the long run and now here we are five years later and it definitely is making a big difference uh, and like russ said we we still have a lot of room to grow uh, to improve on but we are making a lot more Absolutely. positive hey, improvements everybody's much more engaged from the principal level especially yeah. we had some excellent conversations with them so yeah. they have definitely taken it to heart and are we're, we're moving forward we working on setting expectations this year really focusing on that and right. uh, really kind of move us along creating that culture of safety again right. so so uh, when I came back in April, we were talk I, I mentioned something about cybersecurity and just a brief update. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand we do have some some positive news on that at least yes, on cybersecurity. Could we yes. at least talk about that real quick? Yes, yes, absolutely. We, we were able to secure coverage, um, so we have uh, we have policies in place there. That was and, and the, that market has changed tremendously over the past couple of years. The past couple of renewal cycles, it's become very challenging just to secure coverage. We still need to expend more money and, and effort in uh, shoring up our resources there, our, our, our different security efforts, multi-factor authentication. We didn't know what MFA stood for uh, three years ago. We sure do now because all of the underwriters are pushing those, those, uh, those features, <coughs> those, uh, those security functions that you can put in place. So uh, we were able to secure coverage. It's, but that, that market has gone from, I don't know, James, some 30 or so carriers down to three or four yeah. that we've got to, to look to with yeah. even that now. So it's very challenging to even secure that coverage. So it's, um, it, it's definitely an impact, but I'm, I'm happy that uh, thanks to our folks, uh, our, our brokers at Alliant, uh, we were able to secure coverage. So uh, we're in a good position. And something that FISBIT does for all of their members is they do security scans of our systems and all. So. <laughs> yes, we facilitate that. And it's... Uh, Russ is right. That that market is just yeah. almost impossible now. Uh, I'll be honest. They don't like public entities. Right. They especially I'm going to say they especially don't like school systems because again, your focus is educating kids. Okay, it's not cybersecurity. Okay, it's right. not the first thing on your mind. So um, we have a, some room to improve there uh, quite a bit. But it, it is to your benefit, especially for what I call your critical infrastructure. Okay, your critical infrastructure has to have really good cyber security, the stuff that, you know, that you can, that they can shut you down on, you know, your payroll, um, you know, all your computer systems, you know, all those kind of things, uh, your HR, all, all that, you know, it has to be, comp it has to be protected, right, because they're coming after you. Yeah, I believe uh, Broward County Schools had to deal with that a couple of years ago. Yes. Well, we had one of our members, Citrus Alaska County, got hit yeah. uh, during the summer. Uh, they had one server one server and it was a backup server that they hadn't updated properly okay that one little niche okay it got into the backup server and then it was able to spread throughout the entire system so they are creative um, they're ruthless just to be honest um, and they're difficult to deal with mr. Brian I just want to say I just want to thank you and, and the Fizbit group it's uh, it's nice to know that uh, one, you're not only looking out to make sure that we're insured properly, but you're also helping us to keep our costs down. And I think, uh, like you said, Mr. Frakes and his 
group do a fantastic job. As you know, board, you know, we do meet uh, routinely with Mr. Frakes and he gives us these, these updates. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, uh, that we learned in this situation where some of the costs are going up, it's a main area is where property values are going mm -hmm. up. So I think we can understand that costs are going up across the board in whatever entity Everything. right now. But I do appreciate also, it was probably three years ago, we looked at some of our trainings and we, we took a, a self-assessment and we said, I think we can do better with trainings. And our trainings that we've done to impact our claims have <coughs> significantly gone up. So I appreciate that conversation. Mm -hmm. That helps keeps our, keep our costs down. But again, I think routine meetings is important. I, uh, I now look forward to our annual meeting much more than, than <laughs> at the very beginning. So just yes. appreciate uh, the board's leadership and making sure that, uh, that we're going the right direction in this area. <coughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, real quick, uh, Scott Blazer, who is with Fizbit, was was introduced, but he wasn't here, but he did show up. So I just want everybody to see Scott. Scott does a great job with uh, Fizbit and helping on the uh, doing security and things like that. So he does a great job. So uh, so we'll move on down to 8.42 virtual school service agreement between Imagine Learning LLC and the School Board of Okaloosa County, Florida. 8.43 contract between the school board of Okaloosa County, Florida and K-12 Florida LLC for fuel ed online educational products. 8.44 contract agreement between the school board of Okaloosa County, Florida and Panhandle Area Educational Consortium. And then 8.45 permission to apply for the 2022 through 2023 uh, IDEA Part B Entitlement K through 12 and IDEA Part B Entitlement Pre-K Grants. 8.46 Corporative Service Agreement between Florida State University Board of Trustees and the School Board of Okaloosa County, Florida. 8.47 Educational Services Agreement between uh, the School Board of Okaloosa County, Florida and the Okaloosa Academy Incorporated to provide educational services to students placed with the Department of Juvenile Justice in Okaloosa County. And I see Mr. Sansom is out there today. Good to see you, sir. And uh, 8.48, health care services agreement between the MaxVax LLC doing business as Health Hero Florida and the School Board of Okaloosa County, Florida. 8.49, memorandum of understanding between the School Board of Okaloosa County, Florida and North Florida Medical Centers Incorporated. 8.50, a memorandum of understanding between the Sc Children's Volunteer Healthcare Network Incorporated and the School Board of Okaloosa <laughs> County, Florida. 8.51, corporate agreement between the School Board of Okaloosa County, Florida and Children's Home Society of Florida for the 2022 through 2023 school year. 8.52, Title II, Part A, Florida Department of Education project application for 2022 through 2023. 8.53 summer learning camps projects application from ESSER grant funds and 8.54 2022 through 2023 career dual enrollment articulation agreement between Okaloosa Technical College and the public high schools of the school district school district of Okaloosa County Florida and 8.55 Carl D Perkins post-secondary entitlement grant for the 2022 through 2023 school year uh, 8.56, Carl D. Perkins Secondary Entitlement Grant for fiscal year 2022 through 2023. 8.57, Computer Science Teacher Bonuses Grant Application for fiscal year 2021 through 2022. 8.58, Bureau of Federal Education Programs Title III English Language Learners Grant Application for the 2022 through 2023 school year. And then finally, 8.59, allocation of district level secretary, 12 month position. Yep. And I see that that is funded through the ESER funding, the grant. That is correct, funded through ESER. And as I think you know, mm -hmm. I think ESER started with the first grant. It's gone to uh, many grants, which, many. We're, which we're grateful for, but the management of that is becoming more and more. And I think this position is gonna really help That's us. That's what I'm hearing. That it's but funded again, through ESSER dollars. We're thankful for the money, but it has become a huge um, position. But I, I'd also like to say that for the public that maybe over the last year or so, they've been hearing us 
create some other positions like that, but to understand that uh, many of these positions um, go along with those ESSER funds. So when those end, uh, that position may or may not be there that the person understands. It might be that we, the employee might stay, but not the position. Like for example, once ESSER funds go, we don't have to really have anybody to uh, help distribute it, all that. So um, I just think maybe uh, someone in the public might see a lot of new positions, but to understand that's not actually increasing our budget or you know putting a taxing on our our general budget with that but that uh, we understand that. and we're and we're looking ahead uh, to not only attrition in our uh, workforce but also knowing what those grants how long they're going to go and I believe ESSER goes out to right now to 24 next school year and the year after okay so so we're going to have to find 82, 83 million dollars to help keep all these wonderful programs and everything that we've put in place. So. Well, I will say it. So our school district, just like uh, the vast all majority of school districts across the state, have hired positions that will mm -hmm. go across next school year, the mm -hmm. year after. And I'll, I'll speak for Okaloosa. Our goal is to uh, help bridge the gap of, of learning loss and right. what has occurred over the last uh, two years. So we're putting uh, many measures in place mm -hmm. on the personnel side as mm -hmm. well as programmatic side, mm -hmm. as well as training, professional development, to do everything that we can do for our teachers and staff and students and families and get back to, uh, I would say, more normality. Yeah. So uh, we do clearly understand that after this next two year period, we'll have to reassess and look at positions, look at programs, see what stays and see what goes, mm -hmm. uh, but I think maximizing those dollars for the intent that they were sent, mm -hmm. making sure that we're good stewards of those dollars over the course of the past two years, but also the next two years going forward. Done a nice job. Absolutely, here. I agree. And uh, just, just a couple of quick uh, comments. I guess I would first like to start with a question. Um, and here we are, we're looking at a, a secretarial position. Mm -hmm. Roughly, how many millions of dollars has the Okaloosa School District received or projected to receive of ESSER funds? Do we have an estimation? So I'll give you an estimate of approximately 85 million. A little okay. higher than that. What I read. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So approximately so, 85 million. So 85 million dollars, and have we added any administrative positions uh, to administer those funds? Mm -hmm. So we have added some positions across the board, some administrative, instructional, uh, secretarial, as you can see here. As you can imagine right now, uh, I'll say folks, whether at the school district level or at the, even the school base level, I think prior to the pandemic, uh, I think their job and their job descriptions were already full. Mm -hmm. And for example, right now, Amy Dale, who's taken over, who was taken over the vast majority of ESSER, uh, and she's done it extremely well, but she also had everything else that she was already uh, mm -hmm. doing. And when you uh, drive out of here at five o'clock, six o'clock, unfortunately, you still see Amy Dale's uh, car here. And of course, you know, when you are in a business like this, you, you, you put in the time to get the job done. I say all that to say, we're blessed to receive those funds, but the management of it and what's, and what's required of the management of it has taken, um, it takes a lot to get that job done. So again, this position right here, I think is gonna really help us to ensure that we track everything that we need to track and that we dot our I's and cross our T's the way that we need to and the way that we have. Well, these are federal programs that are audited and so we do need to make certain we dot those I's and cross those T's and every penny is spent the way that it's designed to spend. And I guess that was the, the point that I was trying to make that uh, these dollars are being administered by a shifting of responsibilities uh, among mostly current uh, employees and and this is a secretarial position that we're adding to assist in that and uh, in my mind it, it demonstrates uh, great frugality on the part of the school district and uh, just adding the secretarial position for the amount of money that that That's person right. will be looking at is that's right it's not it's drop of the 
you know, dropping the hat. So it's definitely worth it and needed. And it's coming right out of those funds, like you said, we've got to use anyway. So these grants aren't easy to to write, to apply for, to follow, to follow back up That's with, exactly. and yeah. like they are very time well, the, 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 all the accountability pieces, the accountability, company, yes. the receipt of those federal dollars. Uh, yeah. huge I was just going to say, <coughs> as someone who has written grants and had to do the follow up, that. I just want to give kudos to the district staff members who are in charge of that because the follow-up, the accountability, as you say, but more importantly, the thing that I really appreciate in the superintendent and staff is the planning piece mm -hmm. because you can't be in receipt of $85 million without a huge planning process for how those funds will be spent and to be accountable to the public for how those funds will be spent. So I really am appreciative of the planning process. Thank you. So now we'll move to Section 9, Superintendent's Human Resource Recommendations, 9.1, Employees on Administrative Leave, 9.2, Deferred Retirement Option Program, the drop, 9.3, Administrative Managerial and Professional Technical Personnel Recommendations for the 2022 through 2023 school year, 9.4, Personnel Recommendations, 9.5, Employee Separations, 9.6, Employee Transfers, uh, 9.7 employee suspension, 9.8 employee termination, 9.9 .9, employee termination, 9.10 reinstatement, reimbursement of sick leave due to line of duty illness, injury, medical examination, and finally 9.11 leave without pay. Section 10 discussion agenda. At this time, there has been no items moved from the consent agenda. Section 11 is construction programs owners representatives business. And Dr. Kelly, I will turn it over to you, ma'am. Of course, you remember we've already had our June uh, meeting and our June report, and we look forward to July's coming up very shortly. And I'll present that to you as soon as we have it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we do have a couple of action, a few action items. So 11.2 will be the authorization for professional services agreement from Faithful and Gould for price validation for program number six, task order number 19, Richburg School Building 12 renovations. 11.3 authorization for professional services agreement from faithful and Gould for price validation for program number six task order number 20 2022 through 2023 priority roofing projects and then finally 11.4 tpm program number six task order number 21 pre gmp for longwood elementary school classroom renovation and i'm so excited that's going to be a big deal to <laughs> to do longwood it's that's gonna big it um, all sounded great how many years ago the open classroom yeah sounded great right. but um, yeah. this is excited about this one so yeah but it's gonna be um it's gonna be students it's gonna be a it's gonna take a while to do that i think for and that right dr smith it's gonna take a little bit to because it's such a challenging situation but it'll be it'll be better when we get there right and to your point miss gardner about the uh the classrooms I think the people who are who might be listening to this that might be new to Okaloosa County or don't have children that go to Longwood uh, Longwood has actually had an open concept so what that means is that we have some classrooms that are one big room with four classes in there and they all share the same common area there with some dividers uh, so we are going to finally give them their own classrooms and kind of close that up so and, and as a rem go ahead Dr. Kelly I was just going to say, as someone who's taught both in an open classroom <laughs> and in a closed classroom, it makes quite a difference. Although I will say that students who've been in there a while kind of learn to tune that out and they right. just listen to their the voice of their teacher. But it is much more difficult to teach in that environment. So I'm, I'm very happy for Longwood. Yes, no, absolutely. And just as a reminder to the board, we, we already did put the <clears throat> perimeter wall mm -hmm. in place. So. We knew that in terms in of safety, hallways. wanted to make sure that that was done, but the it's hallway walls mm -hmm. are all in place. And then starting approximately next summer, we'll start looking at pod by pod of uh, instilling those walls. Right. All right, thank you. All right, so, so now we'll to, to section 12 and information technology seat management contract. We have no items on there. So section 13, attorney's business, Mr. McInnes? No report this morning. All right, thank you, sir. And section 14, out of state, uh, superintendent's business 14.1 will be out of state student trip request and mr chambers 14.2 i'll turn it over to you sir thank you mr bright school board 
I do have a few folks I'm going to have come up and just give a, a few highlights. But I first want to say uh, welcome back, Ms. Appleberg. It's, uh, it's great to see you. And though I say welcome back, I know that you've been uh, doing a lot behind the scenes, so to speak. Absolutely. <laughs> so welcome back. I also want to say, just due to the fact that it's the last <coughs> school board meeting of this school year, um, just really thanking the employees of this Okaloosa County School District. And you think back to the this time last year where we were contemplating that we were going back to a more normal school year, and I would argue <laughs> the first nine weeks were probably even tougher than the previous year. But again, we're blessed to have teachers, staff, administrators, district folks who really uh, were resilient, um, helped us forge through, and here we are at the end of a school year. So I couldn't be more grateful for the work that, uh, that was accomplished uh, this, this school year. I wanna start off by saying one of the items that, uh, that will, that's on the agenda is the SRO contract. And I do wanna thank the sheriff, uh, Sheriff Aiden, for really working with us as we go through this contract. As you know, in many parts of the state, uh, the school district funds the entire cost of the school resource officer program or they don't necessarily have a quote school resource officer um, at the schools they look at other means we're blessed here in Okaloosa County that the county commissioners and the sheriff make this a priority so just really want to thank them for their leadership also we already talked about the partnership with uh, Eglin and the STEM program so I won't go on there other than to say you know when it comes to career technical education when it comes to stem education that's something that's important for us as a school district and it's one of the parts of academic excellence and it's part of modern innovation we want to continue to get better in those areas i'm going to ask dr hale to come up one of the things that we are looking at uh, day by day i would say is where are we on hiring and you know whether it be instructional whether it's um, ed support it's something that right now we have to really pay attention to because if you look at across the nation what you read on the instructional side is teacher shortage mm -hmm. and what you, you what we know hiring teachers isn't what it used to be and on the ed support side you know it's something that we have to focus on as well if you go across Okaloosa County right now the state of Florida the nation you see help wanted signs um, everywhere so hiring is a big deal but I want the board to know the public to know that this is something that we're taking seriously because we know that we need high quality competent folks that are in our classrooms and in our schools doing a great job so making that a priority is important uh, thank you mr. chambers and good morning board I, I am happy to let you guys uh, be updated a little bit on where we are in the hiring process I know that you've probably read not only the nationwide news about the teacher shortages but our local media has been asking some questions and we've been uh, talking to them about that and one of the things that I have noted in reading some of those uh, articles that are out there is that um, we're all kind of in this together however I think that Okaloosa is doing some things that have put us ahead of the curve um, and I just wanted to kind of give you some numbers and then some things that we're doing moving forward to uh, kind of increase our leverage in the market so to speak uh, with employees um, the one thing that I wanted to really just let you know is as of this moment 7:23 a.m. is when I put this together this morning um, in this hiring season we have 265 new faces and new places already um, now what happens typically in the month of June is that all the transfer stuff happens and that's where the bulk of the activity has been you've seen that in your board reports we've had 129 transfers uh, occur across the district um, now with all of that aside I've told you before we typically have anywhere from 200 to 250 vacancies that we fill over the course of a summer and that's um, pretty pretty much what we're doing this year looking at new stuff we have already 59 new hires to the district and 77 that are in queue right now so um, uh, you know I'm not the math guy but that looks like a little over hundred about 136 um, positions filled already um, you know decisions that have been made in addition to the transfer so I'm very excited about that um, just so that you know I did look this morning um, the newspaper article where I said there were approximately a hundred instructional 
uh, positions that are posted, well, that's been reduced to about 66 school-based as of this morning, uh, which is good. I've looked across the spectrum of the district, and there's um, no, there are no schools that don't have a plan for what they're doing right now. There there's very few schools that have more than one or two instructional positions posted. Some that had more, I've reached out to them recently, and and they just haven't pressed the button. They're finalizing some decisions and things like that. So uh, you know. We're never going to have a 100% picture of where we are because we don't know what the unknowns are that may occur between now and the end of the school year. But um, I'm not I'm not thinking that we are in dire straits, especially related to our relative to our surrounding counties right now. Our principals are really really moving forward on the hiring process. And like I said, it's only it's only June right now. And Dr. Um, Hale, rem yes. remind me and the board when was our hiring fair? So that's one of the things that I was going to mention in terms of some of the innovative strategies that we use. We've, we've got ahead uh, of the hiring curve really early this year. We had a hiring fair in March. Not only did we put positions and allocations, not allocations, but positions based on allocations um, out there at that time, we also were giving some early commitments so that we could get um, the new the, the new people to the district, especially the uh, ones that are coming with the um, educational certi or educational degrees that would lead to immediate certification, we wanted to get our hooks into them really, really easy. We, we had some success there. We did get some early commitments, um, but we've been doing some other creative things as well. In fact, we've got another job fair that we're in the planning stages for, not for instructional, but for ed support. I'll get to them a little bit later, but we're going to continue to not only visit other job fairs, we've, we've extended our reach to other uh, community uh, events as well and we've expanded our regional uh, reach with attending things that we've never attended before to actually get involved with other people's job fairs all the way even as far as South Florida uh, when we were um, involved in the minority fund for uh, Florida teachers event which was down in South Florida so um, we're extending our reach and we're doing a lot of things with fairs but one thing that I thought was interesting um, we have you know one of the things that we continue to look for is ESE positions and especially our itinerants. We have been interestingly successful using Indeed for our occupational therapists and our and our PTs as well. We actually have hired many through Indeed and we're extending our reach there as well. So that's that's something that's new to us. We don't you know we we like to use our oasis primarily but we're we're utilizing other means to go get in front of other people um, doing that as well. We've done some uh, interest zooms we've got some procedures that we use to identify walk-ins especially those that are coming to uh, present themselves as substitutes the first question we ask them is do you have a bachelor's degree and wouldn't you like something more permanent um, we've got all kinds of things like that that we're working on right now um, as you you guys have requested uh, in recent meetings an update to some of our exit survey um, procedures so we've got a new exit survey that accompanies our separation document that will more inform our recruiting practices so we're looking forward to gathering data on that that's already uh, live and in prime time the principals are beginning to use that right now um, as people separate um, and, al and also we're going to be increasing our social media blast with some specific uh, types of things like one thing that actually just went out this morning was for what we're calling interest zooms we are trying to get in front of people that are just not sure don't know what the job's about and interested in talking our professional services department is going to be doing weekly zooms with people in the community they're just interested in finding out what they can do um, and reaching out that way so um, just a lot of creative things that we're doing uh, to try to further reduce our our vacancies now um, 66 school-based vacancies is still a lot um, we're going to continue to pound the bricks. I would like to use every vehicle, including this one, to continue to ask for uh, anybody that, that has interest in ESE position or secondary mathematical position. Um, those are the things where we seem to have the, um, the openings right now. So uh, come and talk to us in Human Resources. And by the way, uh, again, as I always do, I cannot not utilize this time to extend my thanks to the the human resource workers over there they are grinding hard right now um, everybody from our analysts who are working with the hiring to our position control folks um, uh, professional services folks they're really working hard right now um, to make this as efficient as possible in fact we've got 78 uh, brand new substitute applicants in the last 90 days alone um, so everybody from Rachel who does the substitutes through Donna and Janet that work with our applicants uh, are working really, really hard. And as you can see, with 265 transactions in a month, um, they are really, really burning it up over there and doing a good job. Um, but the need exists, and so we will continue to 
uh, recruit. We will continue to look for innovative ways to bring the right candidates in here. Um, and once they get here, we'll, we'll train them up. And um, yeah, that's, that's where we are in HR right now. A lot, of, a lot of activity over there. Any questions for anybody? You mentioned the unknowns. Of, um, do you have any <laughs> stats on um, anything like uh, like we're approaching July 1, which changes the year, like do people wait, employees wait sometimes, and or what number would wait to say the middle of July or something to uh, go ahead and um, resign? So anecdotally, I don't have any hard data on that. That is something that we address through our exit survey. But anecdotally, as a former principal and you as a former educator, you know that there are some people that just kind of keep it close to the vest because they want to uh, keep their options. Um, so always we anticipate some of that, but we don't have a way to, to know yeah, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we ask, and I know that every single one of the principals sends out a, an, I can't remember what we call it, but it's a, a sheet of paper, a survey that goes out to, uh, yeah, your intent, yeah, your letter, your, uh, your intention. Uh, and so all we know is what we know. And then I've, uh, there's obviously some surprises. Someone will get married and leave, or someone will be PCS, mm -hmm. or someone will just uh, decide that, you know, they like hanging out with their grandkids and want to retire and things like that those do happen um, but it is not the over overwhelmingly we know where we are we think and, and so we'll handle the surprises as they come uh, I'm not trying to be facetious or anything with this but have you approached some individuals who have retired maybe been out a couple of years and ready to come back because I actually heard you uh, hey I'm still in <laughs> I think <laughs> uh, I'll go teach I loved it um, talked to some people at the, yesterday that said you know I, I would I might go back and I said mm -hmm. we will hire you absolutely <laughs> and I know these are quality teachers but I didn't know if there was a way to even kind of do that officially but uh, I you know we have a lot of, of wonderful former educators out there and, and employees out there that uh, we might want to say hey you've had a little break come on back we'll use absolutely you. and the one thing that uh, we actually had this conversation in the office this morning um, about the unfortunate nature of having to wait a year before we can reach out to people like that because sometimes they fall away from our contact sometimes yeah. they they get off of our radar but so any ideas that you might have or anybody might have as to how to reach those um, experienced veterans that are ready to return as you said we are ready to talk to them well dr kelly and i both were looking at the english openings i know and thought you know we, yeah, we could do it okay so you'll just want to go meet with donna and she can work you through the application <laughs> process it's not a problem at all okay. <laughs> it is a shame they have to sit out, and I know that's state and everything, sit out that year. Um, but I've heard several teachers that have retired and they have been out, and they're looking to come back mm -hmm. as assistants um, most times to help pay for insurance. But if we could target those. Well, and I would say if you have someone that's out there looking to be a classroom assistant, that's our greatest need in the ed support realm. Mm -hmm. um, always looking for parapros, always mm -hmm. looking for ESE parapros. Um, and I don't think it's out of bounds to say that through the General Appropriations Act, our, our, our minimum salary, our minimum, minimum hourly wage for ed support will go to 15 at the bottom this year. So um, that's statutory. We don't have any, you know, that's not even a negotiated thing. It'll be at least $15 an hour. So if you want to talk to people that are wanting to be a para pro, uh, we have room for them. Well, I mean, and great job to you and your department. Um, you mentioned there's 200, 250 something vacancies, but approximately 136 have been filled. And unless the reporting was inaccurate, there was some information given about a district close to us that had about the 200 opening openings. And they mentioned that they only had four of those positions filled. So it sounds like we're in a much better shape and we're getting there well one of the things that i would just like to point out i don't want to spend all day up here just kind of selling okaloosa but that's what we do mm -hmm. i think that when we are put on a sliding scale uh, instructionally and in support against our surrounding counties from our salary to our benefits to just the the way that our schools are and everybody in our leadership among the schools and our colleagues among the schools um, I, I don't think it's a it's tough a decision way. i think it's a easy choice mm -hmm. you would choose okaloosa 100 percent of the time so I would be worried if you stood there and said we only had four built. <laughs> <laughs> so, that nice reminds job. me when nice the, when a let's say a teacher does come back, are they put at the very bottom? Where do they come in? Well, that would depend on if they had retired or not. Gotcha. Okay. If someone has retired, then they would begin again. If someone is bringing 
experience credit without retiring, they right. would get the full benefit but of their totally experience. If you totally retired, you come back in. Correct. But you know what? Many of them, <laughs> they're coming back at a lot higher pay than they, they spent a lot of their career making Correct. the way we've moved up the scale. So thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, mentioning about retirement and all that, I know uh, the last couple of years with the Florida School Board Association, we've been advocating hard to get those rules relaxed. So I know each of y'all, all of my colleagues talk to our elected people mm -hmm. all the time. So, you know, mention that to them. This would be a benefit to help with uh, yeah. not just our district, but districts yeah. across the state. 100%. Yeah. They can't Absolutely. even come and volunteer. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about, just yeah. re relaxing the rules so they can at least come in and volunteer. Because yeah. some of them just will tell you, yeah. I just want to just be in the yeah. school, you and know, help and, mm -hmm. and help out. Thank you, thank Dr. You, Dr. Hale. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Hale. And just summarizing or, or closing this, this part up, and just so, so the board knows, and I know you do, so when you look at Mrs. Lightborn and her group, you know, they're paying attention to the content area of vacancies and then having conversations with Dr. Hale. As you know, Mr. Horton and uh, Ms. Perry, you know, they're looking at the allocations that go out and making sure that uh, we're conservative in, in that approach, but being very knowledgeable of where we are in the hiring season so I just appreciate that that full gamut and then I want Miss Lightborn just to come up and briefly just kind of share with us where we are with summer school as you know this board has said that you wanted to make sure that we were as aggressive as possible and get as many kids involved mm -hmm. in summer school um, and, and I think uh, we, we did that Absolutely. Um, I feel very positive of how summer school is going. Um, we had a training day for our teachers with uh, specific to iReady and summer school on how to use it. So uh, now we're nearing the end. Um, the last week of June, we will be doing our post testing. Um, hopefully for any students who were potentially retained, we'll have a, a success story for them for moving forward. So um, I feel like we're in a very, very good place with, with our regular summer school. I also want to mention we have several other programs going on. You know, the lifeguard program is going on. I believe that's been very successful. Um, summer scholars, we made an addition to summer scholars. We did a north end and a south end this year. We've typically only done one. Um, location and both locations um, just really thrived. Kids had a really good time. I, I had Jeff Palmer and I went and visited and they were just so excited to show us all of the different things and demonstrate what they had made and what they had done. Um, it was all hands-on so that was a, a huge success um, as well. I think those students will want to come back next year if they're able to if they weren't eighth graders because this is for seventh and eighth grade middle school students. Um, so uh, that was a success. We have um, uh, some CTE programs still going on and those have been very successful as well. Uh, I think I saw on your Facebook um, over at Pryor mm -hmm. um, yep. with Je uh, with Mr. Reinierson's group um, doing carpentry. So there's lots of summer programs going on for our students. Um, uh, beyond just regular summer school. Um, I get reports of our secondary and those students are completing courses like they need to so that they can progress forward. So um, I think we're in a, a pretty good place as we move forward into the next school year. Thank you. All right. And then I'm going to ask Mr. Hort to come forward on, on two items. Just want to keep the board updated on, on focus. As you know, we're, we're, we're hot and heavy into <coughs> this transition. And one of the pieces that will be occurring here shortly is parents will be getting their parent account so they can link their students up to that account and get even more information. And I've also asked Mr. Horton just to kind of give us a, a quick capital update, especially as it pertains to half cent projects as well, as we're actually starting to, uh, what I would say, turn some dirt now on certain projects, which is uh, exciting. But first, a kindergarten enrollment update, because I know that's what's on everyone's mind. Yay. I think I told you two weeks ago we were at 1360. So this morning when I checked, we're at 1480. Wow. So 120 wow. kindergartners <laughs> found their way into oh our schools, uh, or remotely, to get registered. So that, that's awesome, and we're continuing to, to watch that. And again, that's where it's most challenging to predict the number of teachers needed. Um, and so we use historical reference, and if a school had six the previous year, and and maybe one retired, then we might go into the summer with five and see what happens. 
Um, but if not, then we probably would, would go with six and then make an adjustment where we need to. So um, continuing to grow and work and, and transitioning that into focus, um, our, our tech lab and our folks are working daily with one group or another to, to try to get us up to speed. Um, again, the approach is not to be 100% focus with all features and benefits the first week of school. It's to be able to get into the school year and do the critical tasks that we need to um, and then grow as we go. And so there's a training plan in place to do that. Um, our gradebook managers now, uh, two different groups have been trained and I wouldn't say that they're 100% ready to go and fully implement this at the beginning of school, which is the case with a lot of new um, pieces of, of software. Uh, we've got one more group of gradebook managers to come in and train on the 29th. Uh, we start in July really full speed training different groups of folks. So we'll have administrators in with their discipline secretary and or attendance secretary, um, just lots of different folks, uh, ESE, MTSS, and all those components that really are in needed when we get the school year up and running. Um, and then the support piece behind that. So every, every part of focus, let's say discipline, for example, or attendance has what we call a process owner. Um, and a great example of that is our ELL. So there's a lot of data input for English language learners in our database right now. Lisa Tucker is our ELL district specialist. She's our process owner for that. So she knows what should go where, and she's done a lot of great work this summer in terms of how to help school-based people understand what to put where in terms of plan dates and when students' uh, progress needs to be reviewed, those sorts of things. So we have process owners across the board, and they're all learning their own roles right now. So it's a, a lot going on. Uh, I will say from the parents' perspective, uh, we're targeting a couple things, so some important dates, and we'll begin to see this out on our websites and call-outs. July 15th is our target date to invite parents to begin to create their own accounts. Now keep in mind, with all of our kindergarten students that have already registered, those parents created their accounts back in May. They were able to do it. We just haven't marketed it yet to all of our parents of existing returning students. So we'll do that beginning the middle of July. They'll be able to do that from a, a site on our webpage. Uh, we have an app. So currently you know we have that grades app that parents can review students grade. That, that changes and it moves to the Focus Community app. And so they'll be able to download that app and um, you know, after asking their kids how to do it, then they'll be able to create their own account. Um, and then we'll have a process in place, and I mentioned this before, by which they can link their students at multiple schools to their account. And that can be done and will be able to be done remotely using codes um, and identifiers. And so we won't have our, our parents um, you know, um, cascade upon the schools the first day of school to try and get those accounts set up. They'll have an opportunity to do that uh, virtually. Now, the first day of school, if you're, if you're a former teacher, understand there's not a lot to see in the grade book the first day of school. And even in our current system with pause, we didn't have our grade book up and running for the first period. So the plan is as follows. Our first day of school is August 10th on a Wednesday. Uh, we plan on having parents be able to see their child's schedules on the 15th. Now, every kid's going to get a hand schedule. So parents will know the student schedules before the beginning of the school year because if you remember, middle schools and high schools might have evenings before the school year begins when parents are invited in. I know at the high schools they set up days where, where students can come and pick up schedules and they have tables set up by alphabet. So those schedules will be hand delivered this year. Going forward they won't be, but in the transition they will be. And they'll certainly have extra copies um, if, if one gets lost. But it'll take about seven school days, seven or eight school days, for parents will start to see grades and attendance in the system. So we're really pushing to keep that timeline as short as possible for parents so that once, they, once that happens through their app, they're able to be able to see all the information they need to for their, for their students. Um, the, 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 the other side to that obviously is if you get to the second day of school and you're concerned about something or the third day of school and, and you're concerned about something, we reach out and call the school and they'll be able to talk you through it. But because of the nature of this transition, it's gonna take us about to the, 20, uh, let's see, so about to the 22nd of August, which is a Monday after eight school days before we can put, start putting grades and attendance information out there. All right, so it's important, and our schools will do a great job of communicating with families as well um, for those. But typically, there's a period of time at the beginning of any school year before all that data is up and available to be seen. 
<laughs> well, Mr. Orton, you're talking about scheduling, and that brings back some memories from for me from long, long ago. And I'll I'll never forget what the principal told me when I was doing that. Is he said, Lamar, just make sure that every child has six classes on their schedule. Now that was middle school, and I know you'll do the same thing for high school so that that first day of school, everybody knows where they're supposed to be, particularly with the transition that we're going through. Yep, that's right, because we can pull reports now, today, yep. that says the number of students at this school that have less than six classes okay. or less than seven classes, and so our schedulers in our schools have that list now okay. in June. Good. And they're working that list. Now, when student data comes back and courses change based mm -hmm. on need for intensive sure. reading, otherwise, that happens. But um, you know, as you know too, Dr. White, uh, um, um, when you have students that don't have full schedules and you get to a period of the day, then those students don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's an issue. That's what and we're so talking about. The goal, <laughs> is, yep, that's right. the goal is 100%. And if we have one, then the school has a plan for, for what to do. Um, I will say the other thing is schedules. And, and, and the community you know, probably knows this, but parents, our schools are continuing to tweak and work on schedules right up till the beginning of school to levelize classes, um, to add a section of something. And so there's a real downside to putting out schedules a week before school starts because lots of things change. And it's just the nature of new enrollments coming in and you're reaching a tipping point of having to do some changing. So that's why these schedules are given out to parents later closer to the school year because not because we're just holding information because it's really not set it's until we get to uh, in some cases the weekend before and then those students show up in homeroom with those schedules and we invite them with welcoming smiles and, and ready to start the year again which is I think about 45 days away I think, <laughs> I think Dr. Is that right? Dr. I, don't know. <laughs> it's about, I lost track but uh, so that's that's kind of where we're on focus and I can and talk just briefly on capital um, as we mentioned before uh, we'll be back in the second meeting of July with our five-year capital outlay plan. Um, prior to that, the first meeting of July, I'm going to come and give you an update on attendance and some other capital projects. I just wanted to show you something briefly here, and there's some audio with it, so I'm going to try to make the audio work, but I think it's really uh, now, as we've been completing all of our single point of entry projects, sometimes those don't kick up a lot of dust, if you will, because uh, it's within an existing framework, and some places we are doing construction. So I wanted to share a couple of slides with you here. Um, to let you know and make sure the community is aware that some of these projects really are starting to get away, get underway across the district. So, um, we'll do that. So we've talked about safer schools, obviously. So this is one of our schools in the front end. Um, it's, it's Blue Water Elementary, and so they're one of our schools that is finishing up um, its single point of entry project. Walker is the same construct of a school, so it looks the same. Um, but, but some of these things that are going on right now, you'll see the front way is, is being redone and the curb is being redone to fit kind of what the current needs are. But the lobby area there, we won't <coughs> certainly go into any safety details or security otherwise, but we've got really new looks in some of our, uh, some mm -hmm. of our school buildings and it's really great when these families come in and see um, the investment that they're making in our schools coming to fruition. So across our district, you'll see scenes like this in our schools as we transition to single point of entry. I'm most excited about this next slide. Um, this is Fort Walton Beach High School. So they've begun the work uh, in terms of land and clearing prep and they've put some, some, some wood frames down for footings to begin those multi-purpose buildings. And so as a reminder, we're gonna be seeing those at, at Fort Walton, at Choctaw, I think is next to do some groundbreaking, Crestview High School, Niceville, and, and Baker. We'll all be seeing this. So. Um, I'm going out right now and Ms. Demers is going out and we're getting some video and capturing some things to just kind of let people know what's happening. Now, when I click this screen and go to the next slide, Mr. Spolsky's there. He's never silent. You know he's never silent. <laughs> um, and there's video attached to this that I'm going to get corrected and put up on our website and make sure uh, Ms. Ms. Crawford has it as well as part of our board submission. So. He's speaking to how great Steve Horton is and everything. <laughs> <laughs> what, he's, what, what he's doing is he's talking about these projects um, and, and the benefit that will be to the students of, of, of Oklahoma County. So as we move through this, and we'll correct that, apologies. And I, I kind of brainstormed this at about six, seven o'clock this morning. So uh, I threw it on, 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 on folks here and I didn't give, didn't give them enough time to do it. It's my fault, it's not their fault. Um, 
This is a scene of a crane and doing some demolition work on a portable at Elliott Point. Uh, and they're getting classroom addition and bus ramp reconfiguration project right now. So these things are underway. Uh, Mr. Meyer um, and Steve Bolt did a great job with our portable relocation contractor. It's tough to get a hold of these folks, but we've got a couple of crews in town now. So the number of portables that are being removed, surplus, and demolished, uh, it's impressive. And so it's making way for the construction work that needs to happen. So that's a and great thing. Maybe you could speak just for a moment about demolition in terms of cost feasibility versus yes, moving. Well, and two things on that. So um, a portable that might get demolished might be a 1961 portable. So it's something that we wouldn't necessarily move and use somewhere else. Um, and the cost of moving it is not insignificant. Right. And so it, in some cases when it's unusable at this point, and it may have been a storage portable um, or otherwise at the school, but it's better and more economically feasible just to demolish it where it is exactly. because it does cost so much to move. Now, what we're doing though is we're looking at these portables and if there's some additional life that can be gained from them that maybe are not to what we want to do, um, if there's you know outside um, entities that might we might look to donate a surplus or donate those to, we, um, we, we would look to do that as well. So um, try, to, try to make use of those. This um, final piece here, I was excited, is um, new gymnasium floors. And so Lewis and Davidson are getting new gymnasium floors under the half cent sales tax. Crestview's getting a new gymnasium floor out of our 1.5 mil capital outlay, but again, the fact that Crest you can get one has a lot to do with the, the blessing we have of the half cent sales tax giving us the ability to do some of these things. So I sat in that gym for a while and watched that gentleman back and forth with this huge sanding machine. And um, uh, we've also got a video here of the athletic director, uh, Miss Barry at Lewis School. And so when you hear her, it almost brings a tear to your eye because that young lady played on that floor. Um, and knows it's the only floor that was ever in that school since it was constructed, just like Crestview. Um, and so just speaking about how the kids are going to be excited about coming in and making use of it. So that floor had some more sanding to do. They've got to put some coatings down on it. Then they're going to paint the striping on it, then put more coatings on it. But these floors will all be ready uh, by the beginning of the school year. Uh, and Crestview is in line, and so is Davidson. So it's just fantastic work going on out there. Um, I've reached out to some in chambers of side, Mr. Horton. Yes, ma'am. And yes. one of the things that uh, Mr. Horton just said, and I think it accounts for e every one of these schools right here, the gym floor that was put in place when it was built is the gym floor that was still there. And you think about the age of Lewis, Davidson's a newer school, that's 20 something years old. And then of course you think about the age of Crestview High School. So to finally get a, a new gym floor with the use that it has by all the different entities, I think that's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so what we'd like to do is just kind of upgrade this and add some more video and stories to it to be ready for the July meetings and then to share that out. Um, and then um, as Dr. Kelly works on the construction uh, uh, committee and with the Citizens Oversight Committee, we've got a meeting coming up on July 12th. Um, and so we'll be sharing this information with them and looking at priorities for the upcoming year on these sales tax projects. Hey, I went out towards Florosa and they're about to tear up that parking lot. I can't wait to see that change. That's see, I just, I haven't been out there yet to get some, to get some video, but that's coming up as well. There's a lot going on there as well with their front office. You? I'll get yep, it. Yep, take it landscape's what I've been oh, told. Okay, I'll get take it. the video landscape. <laughs> it looks great out there. It's gonna right. be good. Yep. So I, I have a question real quick, going back to the multi-purpose rooms. So can you explain to just the people that would be watching this, because I do get this question asked a lot, what is a multi-purpose facility? <laughs> right, so it is a, it's, it's a facility that's covered and heated and cooled and has <laughs> restrooms in it, but it's used for multi-purposes. So it's, it's really undefined as to how well it can be used. So Mr. Spolsky, if you would have heard him speak, he would have said, this is gonna support us from any, anywhere from testing and all the testing that we've gotta do because we're making sure we incorporate Wi-Fi and internet in those facilities to um, the fact that um, when we get into our sports seasons and our participation seasons, they have four basketball teams, JV and varsity and even freshmen. They have uh, flag teams, they have wrestling teams, they have dance, they have cheer, they have everything and they're all competing for a finite, amount of space and then heaven forbid the weather's um, 
you know, the weather's unforgiving, and then you've got football that wants to come and do something indoors. So these multi-purpose facilities and anything involving ROTC or, or otherwise. So I think the school will define all those uses for this facility. Um, it, it's, it's an open facility, so it's flexible. And um, the, the benefit will be that, that all of these students, and there are hundreds of them um, that take part in activities across the day, before and after school, will be able to use this facility. And it's not a wood floor, so it will be able to take a beating. Mm -hmm. So if you're you know, throwing rifles because you're part of flag and things hit the floor, then you're fine. I walk into the, some gyms now and I see those little dents in the floor. Mm -hmm. I know that in some cases it's because we're forcing, forcing things into a facility that maybe wasn't designed for it. Right. So. Listen, as a former high school teacher, one of the it, biggest fights I ever saw between people was over a facility on the auditorium between the cheerleaders wanting in there and all these things and then of course the the basketball coach is having a conniption fit because they're on that floor so I can tell you we need these uh, multi-purpose rooms and I can tell you going through SACS accreditation for many many years every time at Choctaw they'd say you need a multi-purpose room you need a bit more facilities for those things because there just wasn't room, so we uh, many times there would be struggles and trying to have events like a dance or a play or something and trying to get in there and so this is exciting. This is really going to make a difference in our high schools and using these facilities. So they'll be used for a lot of, of different things. And one thing I didn't you mentioned testing. Uh, don't we now have to send out like AP testing and all that out to facilities? Off campus, so so and rent facilities right, in some places. So, so, so this would be help this would be a that. place if it, if mm -hmm. the school made that decision that they could conduct their AP testing right in there during a period of time. In the but, and I know that each school campus is different, but essentially, it's more or less the same facility going in. Yes, ma'am. This piece. design is going to be the uh -huh. same. They'll have some. Um, um, does, decoration if you will in terms yeah. of logos and that sort of right. thing and have some, some limited color selections but the uh, size but, but is the same they will look the same yeah great and approximately how many square feet are we looking for this multi-purpose room over 10,000 yeah, 10, wow. plus square feet which is that's it's good. huge that's a lot that's a and lot. uh and i appreciate that you explained in the definition because some, <laughs> some people think it's only going to be used for athletics which is not true it's going to be athletics educational uh, artistic whatever so like you said multi-purpose multi functions so mm -hmm. absolutely and again you could put rows of chairs in there and have an event um, school could have an event they could do ceremonies in there or anything that they need to do and 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 to do this and the other thing that sometimes you hear is to do this is not to say we're not attending to uh, the other needs in the school so this is a big need but for example Crestview High School has some classroom additions coming we're working on projects at Fort Walton right now involving some of their or planning them in some of their classrooms there's new roofing going on different places so um, there's we're blessed right now to have um, the half cent sales tax that helps us do some of these things that are needed well you mentioned earlier about um, PE and inclement weather in this area with rain and the heat and being cold PE can now come inside whereas before our PE departments, they were scrambling around trying to find some place mm -hmm. to take those classes. Yes, ma'am. So now they can come in and they may have to bump somebody that um, has already signed up for the multi-purpose room, right. but at least the, our students can come inside exactly. during this inclement Yes, ma'am. And it's, it's a, these are long-term projects. The pace of construction is slow, so we, we have to exercise some patience. The supply chains are still lengthy, but, we're, we're uh, but it's good to see the ground is, it's is broken there. It's getting yeah. there. Right. All right, and, and am I, I think I'm correct in saying Laura Hill will also get a multi-purpose facility just repurposing a structure. They have, that's right, they have some other, some renovations going on at that school as well that are going to um, give them extra space. Yeah. We, I think we uh, removed a couple of the portables already, if I'm not mistaken. So We're moving portables. And I know Dr. Kelly, she uh, spent many years up there. And sure did. I'm sure those portables were probably there. They when, were there. Yeah. So that's exciting for Laura Hill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horton. And that's all we have. All righty. So now we'll move down to Section 15, Board Members' Announcements and Requests for Information. And I will start with my Vice Chair, the Honorable Dr. Kelly, today. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I really only have two things to discuss. First of all, probably several of us will mention what a great event was had yesterday morning at JoJo's Coffee and Goodness with 
Casey DeSantis. She really wowed the crowd uh, by talking about her new program that's called Mamas for DeSantis. And in that program, she's encouraging women, uh, mothers, grandmothers, and future mothers to get on board with the DeSantis program. But the thing that I was most pleased about was her, just her eloquence and her down-to-earth spirit about that and the support that she has for schools and for education and certainly the DeSantis family loves coming to Okaloosa. So that was really heartening to me. The last thing I'd just like to share is that maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but today is the 50th anniversary of the passage of Title IX. Mm -hmm. I was a, a female athlete, not a very good one, but I was a female athlete and I just think that uh, recognizing the passage of Title IX is very important for the equity of our female athletes. That's all I have today. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. And the Honorable Dr. White. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Well, just to express appreciation to Mr. Frakes and the superintendent and all your folks uh, for working on uh, our insurance program. And, uh, you know, I would, I would just say that uh, I know this board recognizes uh, how important it is that we protect the taxpayer's investment in all of our facilities and uh, we're just very grateful and thank you all of you thank you dr white and the honorable mr danchek mm -hmm. well and going to the title nine you know this year we had all those young ladies come in here that were state champion weight lifters and all that and of course the cheerleaders but uh that shows you where we've come on on that program yeah uh, I want to do, uh, mention a couple things about our Public Schools Foundation. We met the other day and we're getting reorganized for the new school year. And Maggie Tomchek will be our president for next year. And we've added some new members to that board, which we're excited to have come on with us. Also, we've had some change. We've added um, Christy Evans, who's going to be our, um, our uh, student uh, coordinator, services coordinator, along with Miranda Cook. Uh, so we have some new things going there. And also, um, Ms. Lightborn mentioned some of the camps, like the one at Pryor and Riverside, and that does come through the Public Schools Foundation. We sponsor it through grants that we get from Boeing and Florida Power and Light. So uh, we work together to make sure we have uh, those things uh, going. Also would like to uh, single out and congratulate two of my Baker students. This happened right after school was getting out, and that's the two top students in the class of 22 at Baker, Stella Hurley and Ryan Fleming. Uh, these two individuals were given the um, Okaloosa Pub uh, Republican Club scholarship in honor of former legislator who's now passed away, Jerry Melvin. It's quite an honor in that club to receive that scholarship in his name. And I tell you, you can't, you can't find two uh, finer young people to get this. Ms. Hurley is going to be attending U, uh, University of North Florida and being a, wants to be a nurse. Mr. Fleming is going to go to University of Central Florida. He's already in an eight-week pilot program this summer and plans to, to move that way and serve our country in the military. So I'm very proud of those students. They are exceptional and uh, they certainly wowed the crowd when uh, those individuals got to meet them. So uh, I'm, I'm wishing them the best. So that's it. Thank you. All right, and the Honorable Miss Gardner. I'd just like to do a shout out to our maintenance department. I've kind of stopped by a couple of schools and just walking from my car to the front office, I'm, I am just, you know, melting. And these individuals are out there working in this record breaking heat, um, trying to get these schools up and ready. And it's so exciting to see. And there really truly is dust going everywhere because it's so dry. But I'm so proud of our maintenance department and I'm sure they're checking all those air conditioners because I know the first day when the teachers come back, there is nothing worse than to walk into a classroom and your air conditioning is not working. But a shout out, I mean, really, when you walk around and you see these individuals and as hot as it is, and I saw a couple of principals that not only are they building schedules right now and going in and doing interviews. I saw a principal painting uh, a, a room that was gonna be for the faculty. And so um, just, they're working hard to prepare our schools to get ready. And um, I just wanted to recognize them that we do see that. And it's what you say, 40 something days. Exactly. It's gonna be here. Mm -hmm. And everybody's working hard to get there. So, but just hydrate and take care of yourself as it is hot. Mm -hmm. Very. All right, thank you. Ms. Gardner, and I'll just close with a few things. Uh, first of all, I just want to 
congratulate one of our students at Crestview High School, uh, Aiden Paxton, uh, who got a state championship ring in bass fishing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, Thank Crestview you. High School started out with a with it was a team sport at the high school, but due to COVID, they went to a club. Uh, even though they were officially unofficially representing Crestview High School, they were out at all these tournaments. And Aiden actually is receiving a scholarship from Weber International University to fish on their team. So that's pretty awesome. And mm -hmm. if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see that nice ring that he got. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a pretty big ring for bass fishing. But the intent when we switched uh, a couple of years ago when the board uh, 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 changed the policy to allow these uh, these teams to form at the school if they choose to, this is the, the benefit of it now. So we uh, uh, we see these children that are uh, excelling in, in fishing and other activities that are related to the water. So that's pretty. And Mr. Bryant, I think we started the first fishing club at Destin Middle School yeah. when I was principal. There. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Destin, Dewey Destin helped you, didn't he? Yeah. I reached out to the local fishing fleet and they helped us. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, just saw this the other day, um, one of our Take Stock and Children uh, mm -hmm. students, Ella Grace Klinger, uh, was one of the 10 recipients recognized for the Unity Award with uh, Pacers National Bullying Prevention Center. And again, there's a link on uh, the Take Stock and Children page. Uh, if you just go to, to my page, I copied that link on there. So that's uh, pretty awesome. One of our students was recognized. And then also uh, just an opportunity to, to thank uh, the community of uh, Crestview and uh, on Friday, um, I had the opportunity to invite some of our community leaders, uh, parents, uh, some of the secondary principals to come uh, to just talk about issues that were related to Crestview. Uh, when, when I got this going, I reached out to Mr. Chambers and just asked him if he'd be willing to come and just uh, you know, be a participant in it. But it was great to have uh, community uh, feedback in, in the district that I serve. But, I, you know, I do want to recognize that, you know, your board, uh, your school board is constantly and always active in the community. And, you know, this is one of the ways we reach out to sh to just at least, you know, have an opportunity to sit down with people and talk about what might be important to them at that time. So, you know, I appreciate the Mr. Chambers coming at the last minute to uh, to sit with me at that, but we did have a great time. We met at the Heights up in uh, Crestview, and if you ever get a chance to go eat lunch at the Heights or eat dinner, it's a great place to go to go eat. And uh, you know, so thank you to those that were there uh, Friday to meet with Can us. I just make a suggestion, uh, Chairman. That was a great idea, but I wish that we could all have been informed of that, so that maybe we would have liked to have gone or or at least have known about it so maybe we could keep a master schedule of, of some of those things so that we can all be informed okay would that thank be you. I mean, well we would, would likely advertise them if you did yeah. that yeah. that can be that's done yeah. I mean I'd be yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good idea all right and I, that's not a problem uh, let's see uh, other than that I don't have anything else so we'll move down to section 16 public comment uh, will be the two-minute version and right now I have no uh, blue cards for this and uh, we do have one public hearing on Monday night 17.1 public hearing for adoption of the elementary and secondary codes of student conduct for the 2022 through 2023 school year and this will be presented by Brian Humphrey and with that, we'll go around the room. Ms. Well, Apple? Look, may wait, I, wait, wait, yeah, I want to say something on that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Ms. Dr. White. Yeah, go ahead. Go Thank ahead. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess uh, Mr. Humphrey is not here, but of course, uh, th this will be uh, up for vote on, on Monday evening. And uh, my only question pertained to were there changes and were those changes stipulated by statute uh, and et cetera? And also, if our attorney had a chance to review this, if we could speak to that. My understanding in talking to Mr. Humphrey is that this year there were not material changes required to these okay. codes. That's why they're actually here earlier than normal. Okay. When good. we're making significant changes, we've often been pushed right up to the end That's of right. July trying to get them done to get them out to the schools. So he got these done early. Okay. Um, and so uh, I'm not aware of material changes due okay. to legislative action here. All right. Yeah, I, same thing. Um, I'm looking at the part where it says serious infractions and number four, 
talks about possession and or use or under the influence of alcoholic beverages and so forth. And it, it uses some terminology like drug uh, paraphernalia and everything. And based on some action this board has had to make with students, I'm wondering if there might need to be some language put in there uh, pertaining to specifically vaping and edibles uh, to have it spelled out to that point because as we all know we've had to do some action where uh, there was some thought that particularly on edibles that that was not even considered under the category of uh, illegal drug use and I just uh, I'm just suggesting that we might look at more specific language in that part four just to make it clear the, the content of edibles would still be under the controlled substances definition that's here and some of this uh, is pulled directly from our policies uh, obviously as as the different uh, ways in which controlled substances are, are being provided out in the community and are distributed and are manufactured um, we we have not been going into your policies and and by trade name putting everything in because we keep them under that control substance category because mm -hmm. that's the law that regulates that the policies were updated a couple of years ago when uh, the vape pens and the e-cigarettes and things of that nature uh, got to be prevalent uh, even then, we, we did not update by trade or market names, but we did update to include those type um, devices because those were not even in, in the policy at that time. And so, uh, Ms. Vancheck, those uh, devices are in your policies uh, as prohibited. Uh, and I think those are in the area of the smoking. Well, it says 19 says possession and or use of electronic cigarettes. Is that? That's correct. Okay, but back up on... Um, Number three, it says possession and or use of tobacco products. So in a way, we are being more specific. We're not saying vape, but we're doing that. Is there not a way we could in, um, come up with the language for the, the edibles to, to go under four, just like we did, or add it, just like we did uh, electronic cigarettes? Certainly, we can do whatever. Are you the board saying that that's, do you don't think it's I'm necessary? Edible, I'm just suggesting. Edible is regulated by the controlled substances category, and okay. so we want to be careful not to get too specific and leave things out. It, it, that's why we use right. controlled substances and right. use those broad categories because it picks all of that up. Well, and if, if I might suggest an, an, another thing that okay. the superintendent might, might choose to do with his schools. Um, certainly that could be something that could be discussed at every school uh, maybe in the school uh, handbook okay. uh, for students yeah. uh, and it, it would it, just based on what you're saying is a check and the, the, the prevalence now of right. those particular items uh, of course they're often distributed under prescription but then somehow they find their way into the general population but, but based on that prevalence, it, it might could be something that uh, could be reviewed with the student body at every school when, when they review the, the code of conduct. So that's just a thought, trying, trying to be That's a very good point. I was just supportive and helpful. thinking of the prevalence we've had mm -hmm. with that coming no that question. obviously right. uh, some, I'm going to assume that there's miscommunication on knowing that that's mm -hmm. not acceptable. I'm going to be naive and go with that. But um, <laughs> well, I'm going to burst your bubble. But you students that are bringing these, they know, I know. Good and well that this is. But I'm trying, Miss Gardner, to give I, them the benefit here I, by I know, if we've covered every base, then uh, students know you know, that what so. they're bringing. Is just a thought. I just want to bring it up to the board. I mean, I'm not, I'm not pushing no, hard for that, good. but no, just to to your thought, uh, and I'm glad you're bringing that up because uh, the edibles are an issue, uh, not only here in Okaloosa County, mm -hmm. uh, in. in probably would say nationwide in terms of uh, students looking at edibles in, in, a, in a different way. I don't think any of us would have thought edibles and, and right. thought <laughs> drugs. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, the vaping, I'm glad you bring that up as well. And to Dr. White's point, he, he's, he's spot on. One of the things we've already talked about this summer are those very two items, vaping and edibles. And like you said, what are we doing in our first um, assemblies at the beginning of the year when we go over student conduct? at all the levels. So those will be two items that, that will be highlighted. So Mr. Humphreys knows 
um, right now that, that we'll be putting some information together. Also through student services, they're looking at some one-sheeters mm -hmm. that are gonna go to our schools and these one-sheeters are expected to be gone over with our students, not only just in an assembly, but in other means as well. Because we, do, we do need to get more information out on edibles, vaping, okay, and some other that's topics. Great. Thank you, that sounds good. One of our disciplinary hearings, um, one of the, I think it was an assist, uh, uh, middle school that the assistant principal was saying that they had, they went through this code of conduct and then they had students sign something to say that it was explained um, maybe a little more in depth with do we do that, that? Do we have we them? yeah sign off well, on okay that was a taking that a step further I've seen a um, a test <coughs> given yeah which the students scored and then signed and they know uh, so they, there, there was there was some evidence that the, the items had been reviewed mm -hmm. okay I'm done. Yeah. all right thank you all right so before we adjourn Ms. Appleberg anything you'd like to say Welcome back, like Mr. Chambers said. We want to see baby pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I will show all the baby I pictures, <laughs> trust me. Um, I first just want to say thank you to all of you for reaching out to me. Um, as you all know, he was born at 34 weeks. He is very healthy. He is learning what it means to be a teacher's kid already. <laughs> um, lots of Zoom meetings. Mr. Chambers has seen his face plenty of times, I think, in lots of our different Zoom meetings. Um, he's also learning how to be a union president's kid. So, but he's doing very well and I appreciate all of you reaching out and, um, and all of the best wishes. I also wanted to just let you know that on June 1st, we did meet with the district and do our negotiations for our coming, upcoming contract. It was not a full book this year, so it's a, that process is a little bit shorter. There's you know only certain articles that we open up and things like that. So it wasn't near as long as a process as it is when it's a full book, but we were actually able to go ahead and come to a tentative agreement on that date. So we only had to meet one time. We did meet for most of the day and it was a lot of back and forth, but I would like to thank Dr. Hale and his negotiations team for meeting with us and us being able to come to an agreement. And I look forward to that being able to come to the board so we can go ahead and start our ratification. Thanks so much guys. Thank you. Thank you. And going around, the, so we had three speak. Ms. Perry, anything? All right. Well, thank you all very much. This meeting's adjourned. All right. Good job, Jeremy. Thank okay, you. Long you one. said yeah. that please. Awesome.